Ignition sequence starts. Six, five, four, three, two, one, zero. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. Hey everybody, this is the Digital Asset Investor and I gotta tell you about what Linktoo's doing today. They are my sponsor. Today, they've got a $2,500 minimum on all companies until midnight tonight. And then they, uh, they're they having spe uh, President's Day special pricing for Uphold, Automation Anywhere, and Ledger. And that's from 8 a.m. Pacific time today until Tuesday at 8 a.m. Pacific time. It's a 10% discount on pricing. Pretty cool. Just wanted to make you aware of it. Now, from early in this channel, I always related digital assets to being like a new asset class because I used to be a financial advisor at Morgan Stanley. I'm not now, but I used to be. And so it, it, this reminded me, now I learned as I went along that not only was this the first new asset class since bonds, but it was bigger than that. It's the asset class to swallow all asset classes because all the other asset classes are going to be tokenized. And what, how are you going to tokenize things? You're going to have to have ledgers like the XRP ledger. I believe there will be a handful of them. Listen to what this guy says. Uh, this was sent to me from Mike Jansen. Mike Jansen is the creator of the intro and the outro. He's the official creator of the intro and the outro of the Digital Asset Investor channel. Very nice guy. Crypto, this is one of the most bullish things I have ever seen. And I've been in crypto for seven years. Believe me, you want to watch this till the end. So why am I so bullish because of this picture? Here's why. That image was from Fidelity. Fidelity, the one of the biggest asset managers on the planet. And that picture just showed the world changed. So how did it change? Check this out. Typically, asset managers like that do something called a 60-40 portfolio, right? For investment portfolios, for... It's, it's uh, allocating assets, folks. This is what, what I learned when I was a financial advisor. There, you might have 60% in stocks, 40% in bonds. That's kind of a typical weighting. It's one of the, depending on age and all, a lot of different things, somebody's situation. Retirement portfolios, 60-40. 60% stocks, equities. 40% bonds. And that's the way they construct these portfolios. Now let's look at that image again. Something changed. Look closely. We have four different options. Look at the circles. None of them say 60, 40. And then look down at the bottom at the three colors. You see equity, fixed income, and <gasps> crypto, crypto. That says to me this. The way retirement and investment portfolio. I've used the number. This is what this is what I predicted a long time ago, is that crypto would be one to five percent of the portfolio. Once this went mainstream, that it would be one to five percent of the portfolios of everybody on the planet. That's where this is going to go. I was correct. They're constructed going forward. Will continue to incorporate crypto as a pillar piece of the portfolio, not just 60-40. Now it'll be something like 59. Let's watch the last part of that again. Nine two. And you think that number is just going to go up or down? And that is what. All right. Um, very interesting. It is going to go up. Now this clip was going around today, and this is um. Ryan Zagone, who, who used to be in, in, in charge of regulatory affairs at Ripple, he's got a lot of great clips. I can't remember if I've ever seen this one, but it's a great explanation of, it's a great talk on distributed ledger tech. Ryan Zagone, I'm with Ripple. Uh, I want to follow up with a couple comments on uh, particularly the, the conversation about what we'll see going forward mm -hmm. and uh, the ecosystem we see developing. Uh, so right now, the, I think blockchain and Bitcoin has been described as a panacea for everything in financial services. We spent two years working with, with banks for proof of concepts, pilots, and live products that they're working over our network now to learn that that is not the case, that Bitcoin right, or I'll blockchain is not. Sorry, we've got construction projects going on here. And uh, so, by the way, if you hear what sounds like a saw, that is because there's a saw in the background. So here's more Ryan's again. 
to solve all of our issues. As was said earlier, DTCC can go real time today with the technology they have today. It's not a technology problem. What we're focused on and where blockchain comes in is on use case specific issues. So in finding a use case where there's friction that could benefit from blockchain. So in our vision of the future is that you have some blockchain or, or Bitcoin uh, networks developed, both private and public, and you also have centralized systems like DTCC running today. The, and the value we see going forward is not in building a network that everyone uses, but in connecting these different networks. So we see a very uh, a varied ecosystem of both distributed companies and distributed networks along with centralized networks. And the value here is going to be connecting those. There was a comment earlier about do we need blockchain to connect those? And we wholeheartedly think no. We, that is not uh, necessary, and nor do we think uh, we'll likely see that. Uh, likely because of the permissions, the operational resiliency concerns that come up when outsourcing the, the uh, operations of a network to unknown parties. Uh, that's far outside of what we see from in the regulatory construct. Uh, so we likely see uh, an interoperability protocol that gets developed that is not blockchain based. You mean the individual networks may be blockchain based, but the network to network thing is not? Correct. And I would point folks to the W3C, the Web Standards Group for the Internet. They have a, such protocol that they're working on now called Interledger. And it's a non blockchain protocol that connects centralized systems and distributed, uh, along with distributed to distributed. It creates an internet of value, as we see it, where there's connectivity between all different types of systems and systems that are designed for use case specific problems, not one architecture that we apply to everything. I don't think that's where we'll see a practical application. What a great, of these what a great explanation of what is coming. Check this out, Black Swan Capitalist Strikes Again. We've been vocal about the World Bank, IMF, and World Gold Council openly discussing the need for a gold-backed stablecoin for central banks to tokenize gold reserves. After much research, along with Vandal, uh, this is his brother, I think, Miles Franklin, which is uh, uh, Andy Sheckman, we believe XRP will be the key. This is uh, from that World Bank document, XRP. Now, um, I think there's going to be all kinds of stable coins, asset-backed coins, and all types of things built on the XRP ledger. But in terms of calling XRP itself a stable coin, if XRP itself is ever to be a stable coin, I don't think of it as stable. I think of it as having a stable floor, but not stable on the upside. And that's kind of exciting. Brian Brooks, I hadn't seen anything out of him in a while. Check this clip out. There's two clips I wanted to play for you. Think about the history of financial scandals recently, the London oil trade, the mortgage crisis, things like that. All of those things at some level were examples of where human trusted parties are fallible or, or even potentially criminal. But technology is technology. It, it isn't criminal. It has no motive. It's not looking to make more money. It just balances accounts. That's why crypto ultimately is solving a, a thousand-year financial problem, and it will supply the trust that has been lacking. There Think you about go. the history of now financial. Listen, listen to this. This is a great clip from Brian Brooks, and I don't know if it's old or not. So the point that I always try and tell people is, you know, the, the biggest issue that I always try and focus on is cryptocurrencies are really not about currency. And, and the biggest misunderstanding of this whole discussion is the belief that if crypto is not doing a great job of replacing the U.S. dollar, uh, then crypto is failing in its mission. And what I, what I think we'll talk about a little bit today is the idea that most of crypto is about replacing the centralized banking system with networks that allow user control versus bank CEO control. The crypto assets that have prices are more like internet stocks. It's more like you bet on Google if you think there's going to be high internet traffic and you short Google if you think people are going to go back to the post office, right? But it's not that Ethereum or Ripple or anything else is trying to replace the U.S. dollar. It's trying to replace a system of transmitting value. And we'll talk a lot more about that. So for me, the prices are not that relevant any more than Google's volatility is. And in the early days of Google, that was super volatile. But they will be relevant. They're just not yet. Now, our, our old buddy Joe Lubin popped his head out of a hole yesterday. And um, he was on it, or not yesterday, but in the last few days. And he was on it. He did a... He disappeared for a good six months, but now he's back to be arrogant again. 
And so I thought this, this clip was fascinating. It's fascinating to me because this guy talks, this guy talks like he is at, okay, I got, I got interrupted there for the second time, but it's okay. We're, we're, what I was talking about is how Lubin here, he talks like, like he and Vitalik Buterin and them were not meeting with the government and the SEC and the CFTC and Bill Hinman and all of them. He talks about the SEC like they're the bad guys. And this is this guy know, knowing he got a free pass from them. In the United States, um, mm -hmm. a country that likes to they dominate the world uh, through intermediaries, often financial intermediaries, uh, the, the prospect of profound disintermediation um, could be seen by some to be a, a national security issue. Um, and others could see uh, profound decentralization as being consistent with... I'll tell you what a national security issue is, is the trail of Ethereum leads back to Wang Zhang and China, and the CCP. That, that's some national security conversation. The capitalism and Western liberal democracy and uh, that, that debate uh, is going on right now. Um, we, uh, we've had um, a major shot in the arm, uh, both from the judicial system in the United States, as well as uh, uh, grudgingly uh, from a regulator, uh, where um, essentially the SEC was, was forced to, by the courts, uh, forced to approve Bitcoin spot ETFs. And, and that's going to be a watershed moment. Um, uh, on the first day, um, the Bitcoin spot ETFs flippened the SLV ETF, um, the silver ETF. Um, they're sitting at around $30 billion right now. Um, massive inflows. I, th I think in the last couple of days, there have been six, $600 million in inflows. Uh, I went into BlackRock and Fidelity, but the others are, are accumulating as well. Uh, mm -hmm. I think G GLD, uh, the gold spot ETF, sits at around $180 billion. Um, and have you noticed this is another thing that really strikes me about Joseph Lubin and has since we started uncovering Ethgate. Have you noticed how how he's all the time talking about Ethereum as it relates to investing? I've never heard Brad Garlinghouse Brad Garlinghouse and Ripple have always always avoided that entire conversation talking about XRP as it relates to investment. This guy I mean, it's 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 almost as if the SEC told him, "Don't worry," or or he knows he's got some kind of immunity, right? Uh, rise in price and, and increased uh, inflows uh, could could see us uh, could see the the Bitcoin spot ETFs challenge the gold ETF, and that's going to be a a big news story. Um, and it's uh, essentially when you have lots of the biggest pool of capital in history the largest bridges for capital to flow uh, into our ecosystem uh, that we've ever experienced. Um, that's going to drive a regulatory shift in the U.S. as politicians and, and regulators will not be able to ignore or denounce crypto uh, when all the voters, um, uh, through their registered investment advisors, funds, including investment funds, uh, and they're all invested in the asset class. Uh, with respect to the Ether, uh, spot ETF uh, that's potentially coming in May. Um, How does he know? Uh, smart people would give it, say, a 60% chance of happening in 2024. Um, there are reasons why the SEC might might want to um, delay, uh, deny. Ethgate. I can give you some reasons, Joe. Um, XRP unleashed. The ether spot ETF is likely to be ported. How would you like to be these these uh, ETF issuers that are putting out an Ethereum ETF? How would you like to be putting that out right at the time that XRP unleashed comes out, and and they all this huge documentary is talking about ETHgate. What do you think their liability exposure will be when when people invest their money in those ETFs, and all of a sudden? There's a documentary exposing what went on. What if it kills the price? What if it affects the ETF price? What's the liability for the issuers of an Ethereum ETF? You think they're having that conversation? Perceived as more challenging uh, to the existing financial infrastructure um, as the parallel financial system 
um, or, or as a parallel financial system, um, uh, because major financial firms will, will likely not have the same kinds of advantages in a more decentralized financial. Oh, he's so full of crap. It makes me sick. Okay, um, let me see. I'm going to skip that one. I'm going to go. wanted to show you this. FTX investors sued Sullivan Cromwell, accusing the law firm of aiding illicit schemes that helped advance a multi-billion dollar fraud before the crypto exchanges collapsed. That's Jay Clayton's law firm. You, are you seeing how these guys pop up every, everywhere where there's some kind of shadiness going on? Old Jay Clayton and his, these same law firms, same group of different, same groups. As I recall, Sullivan Cromwell was one of the attorneys for FTX before it collapsed. You don't think they knew anything, do you? And then it collapses and they, and they became their attorney. Okay. Similar to, didn't F, uh, I won't go there. <laughs> There's a, I'm going to skip that one. There's, I'm just trying to cover a lot here. Oh, I love this. This is Sean McBride, ex-Rippler. I love this tweet. My wife and I were discussing XRP and the potential reasons why it hasn't exploded like it should. I used the analogy of having a Lamborghini, XRP, but only being able to drive it on a road filled with potholes, current payments infrastructure. Rebuilding an archaic global payments financial infrastructure doesn't happen overnight. But when it happens, expect that Lamborghini to have a nice, fresh, smooth surface to burn rubber all over Gary Gensler's face, jerk. Now, here's what, here, I've always compared this. I think it was Vanderbilt who built the railroad tracks across the United States, and it was Rockefeller who built the oil pipelines. Well, the way I've always looked at this is that Ripple was laying those pipelines for the last 10 years laying those pipelines and laying those railroad tracks. And the second that you actually put a train car on those trail, those guys, it was nothing, it was nothing but burning money and nothing happening for all those years that uh, they were, imagine how, all the land acquisition and the, and the things they had to do to lay those tracks and lay those pipelines. It's all just spending money. And then all of a sudden, when it's finally laid out, that's when the money goes crazy. It's nothing but making money. When those train cars can be filled with all, cor all kinds of different things and moved across the country and people are willing to pay for it, all of a sudden something that was a money spender becomes a massive money maker. And that's how I've always seen Ripple. But I love what, what he said there. Now, um, I'm going to go I'm going to go into the group now. Um, in DAIX, well, first, first I want to show you this. Um, so XRP Las Vegas is really ramping up, okay? The, the, they've added this Farron Pratt guy from um, PeerSyst. Peer is that how you say his name? His, his company? I don't know. Um, we've still got the Perry Ann Borings coming, Christopher Giancarlo, David Schwartz, Simon McLaughlin, CEO of Uphold, Kevin Maloney, CEO of iTrust Capital, Eleanor Terrett from Fox Business, Ray Fuentes, from Link to Jeremy Hogan, Legal Briefs, Robin O'Connell, CEO Uphold, Nancy Beaton from Uphold, John Deaton, Joe Indoso, who is now the, is he the CEO of Link to? I'm not sure. Anyway, but I also wanted to show you this, folks. This, look at the sponsors. Ripple, Ripple's going to be a sponsor. I Trust Capital, Uphold, Merlin, Link to, Sologenic, Reaper Financial, Val Hill Advisors, Ballet. Corium, Casino Coin, Piercist. It's getting bigger and bigger, and there's more in the hopper. Now, also, before I forget, they just, I think they decreased the price, like cut it in half, um, to go to the, this is a private dinner. This is separate from XRP Las Vegas, but it's going to be held while, while we're there, okay? I'll be at this, too. Brad Garlinghouse, John Deaton, Michael Arrington, Christopher Giancarlo, and Eleanor Terrett will all be there um, as guests of honor at this um, dinner that Chamber of Digital Commerce is putting on. So you can go here, go to futureofdigitalassets.com, and you can sign up for this. And they're, they just, I think, have the price. So this will be very um, interesting. Now, in DAIXRP.com, I'm going to talk a little more 
about the behind the scenes, the XRP Unleashed documentary. I'm going to show you some more about what those guys are doing and um, why I think this thing is going to be so massive. Um, I'm getting a text from my kid. What does he have to say? All right. Okay. So anyway, I'm the digital asset investor. I'm not an investment advisor. This is for entertainment purposes only. Please subscribe, hit the like button, tell your friends and family. Away we go.